Larry, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. Uh, it's nice to be here, Tom. Thanks. Nice to have you. Before we get going, we were curious about what your news day looks like. We've been talking a lot about news gathering up here and kind of getting up in the morning and looking at the New York Times or trying to avoid it all day till 5 p.m. As someone who's, whose life sort of does depend on the news, what, is your, what does a day in the life of Larry Wilmore's news look like? Well, I have to balance it. Like some days I just take off completely and I'll just go into sports or entertainment because I have to cleanse, you know, I have to get it off. But I, I'm the, I've always pulled from a lot of different sources. Um, BBC News is a good one. PBS. I'll look at the cable news, but I have to look at all of them, get a little taste of what they're doing. Because a lot of times for me, it's not just being informed of what's going on, but I want to see how people are framing what's going on, too. So that's why I kind of look and see how they're saying things. You know, <laughs> Some of them I can only take so much. You know? <laughs> but yeah. Um, for newspapers, it's usually the the New York Times and Washington Post. I'll look at those, you know, as a start sometimes, you know. There's two things there that I find interesting. One is it reminds me of what President Obama said, something about if you if you only listen to NPR and you only watch Fox News, you right. are living in two different Americas. Like you are having two completely separate right. realities. Is that your is that your experience when you go through with all sort of the cable Absolutely. channels? Completely. It, which is why I like BBC too, because this is somebody looking at us, you know, <laughs> reporting on it, you know, which I find interesting, but I have, and I've always been interested in that. Um, like I watch Fox news, I, like Brett Baer is a show that I take all the time. I always want to see how it's being presented, you know? Um, and uh, I still watch network news, you know, I, I still want to see how the news is being uh, presented in that way too, you know? So I guess some of it, I don't know. It's, it's a weird answer because I kind of watch it from an anthropological standpoint. <laughs> and I know that You're like Jane Goodall, good yeah. Yes, because people say, how can you watch that? I go, I'm kind of observing it maybe more than watching it, I guess, you know? I do find in it somewhere. interesting that you take breaks from it. Oh, I have to. Yeah, definitely. You just, it's too much, you know, it's just, there's too, especially now this year, it's just too much going on. Before we talk about your show, I guess we should get this out of the way. We're taping this the Friday before the American election, but this is airing um, on the day of the American election. So mm -hmm. I know we, we, we won't pretend that we know anything. I guess we won't know anything yeah. until <laughs> we won't fake it. Right. I can't believe how this day is going. Or <laughs> hey, this day like, this day is going great. Yeah. But if you can if you can plop yourself into how you might be feeling on Tuesday, um, mm. what are you, what are you thinking about going into this election as both a comic and as just a citizen? Uh, it's a good question. I mean, Tuesday is just going to be an anxiety ridden day because I don't know if we'll get any results on Tuesday. The way everybody's been predicting it, some people think we may not know for a month or end of the week, who knows? So I'm more anxious about not knowing what the result's gonna be rather than what the result is going to be, I guess. Um, so Tuesday's just gonna be an anxiety written day or while people are listening to this, today is an anxiety <laughs> written day. Wednesday is the day that's gonna be interesting. You know, it's like, what's Wednesday gonna be like? Is it gonna feel like we're in a transition or it's gonna be more of the same or are we gonna be in this mystery land? Wednesday's gonna be very, very strange and bizarre. It's an interesting time to be coming back to TV in the way that you are, meaning not behind the scenes right now, but on television or on Peacock doing essentially you know, a late night show. How are you feeling about it? Um, what were you hoping Wilmore would be? Well, I'm really enjoying it. I'm having a lot of fun. Um, I think there was enough time off where, you know, I didn't feel like I was repeating what I did before, but trying to do something different. The angle of this show, we're just trying to have that conversation that everybody said they wanted to have and finding a, an interesting way to do it with the pandemic going on and all that stuff. So that's kind of how we fashion the show. Even the way I interact with the audience is more conversational. Um, I'm kind of sitting in a, in a set with hardly anything on it, just two monitors. So we're acknowledging the pandemic that we're in and that kind of stuff. And each episode covers kind of a topic, whereas the nightly show, the show I did before, we're really reacting to the news all the time. We run, you know, four nights a week and always, you were always in a reactive state, kind of chasing your tail all the time. This one, we can be a little more thoughtful about issues and that kind of stuff. So it's a little different in that way. I, I find it interesting that you say the conversation we all said we wanted to have. And I think that brings us to the clip mm -hmm. I want to play right now. 
We've been talking about protests on the show, which are often accompanied by looting, you know, and some people try to defend this behavior. So tonight's lightning round, we're gonna discuss, is this looting or reparations? What's the difference, okay? And let me give you an example. <laughs> this is all my take, okay? See, I feel looting is petty, right? But re reparations are kind of cathartic, right? Like, for example, if you take a small TV, that's just looting, right? But if you take a big screen TV, that's reparations, got it? <laughs> That's you talking about a game on your show called Looting or Reparations to Comedian Actor and I guess late night rival now, Amber Ruffin. Um, so I, I think that fits in very well to the, the idea that you have about wanting to have the conversations that people said they wanted to have. Right. And that was that's at the end of the show. We have this fun thing called the lightning round where I come up with these ridiculous categories. And it's a, it's a way to take what is in the news and have an absurdist kind of take on it, you know, is kind of what that is. And we really have a lot of fun doing that, you know, um, kind of kind of as that little bit of sorbet at the end of a meal type of thing, you know, kind of a palate cleanser after whatever we've talked about. So does, does it feel like a bit you could have done or that could have been on TV 10 years ago? Oh, sure. It's something like that. It's a real standard kind of comedy bit. But the content yeah. is something that current, you know. Um, I guess that's what I mean, the, the, the content rather than the, the structure of the bit. It's hard to say, you know, TV is always evolving like that. I mean, we did a joke on the PJs. It's this animated show that I did. This is like 20 years ago. And uh, it was in the projects and Eddie Murphy was the voice, you know. And the kids, the kids on the show found this um, old Richard Pryor album from before. And it was the actual album was called that was crazy. That was the name of the album. And the kids say, Hey, super, can we play this? He goes, play it. You can't even say it anymore. You know? <laughs> and we said that back then. And he's, we couldn't even do that joke about that, about not being able to say it right now, which is kind of interesting. So sometimes things change in that way. And sometimes, you know, they don't, but you know, it's always been difficult to cover, you know, certain subjects in comedy, you know, that's always been the tough thing, but you know, I'm the crazy one, so I always try to do it. What have you figured out about that? Like, what have you figured out about how to how to take on complex and important things uh, without without I guess without dismantling it, without without rejecting its importance, while still being able to joke around about it? Well, I don't know if I agree with that part of it because that's kind of what I do is I kind of deconstruct it and dismantle. I guess maybe the power that it may have over us sometimes by looking at it in a different way. How do you, you mean? Know, so. Well, you know, if we're talking about oppression in some way, you know, I want to deconstruct that and look at it in a different way. So it doesn't have to be something that's going to be weighing me down or preventing me from doing something. I can look at it a different way and, and be satirical absurdist about it, you know, or, have a different opinion about something maybe where the herd is thinking about something in a different way. And I'm like, no, I I'm allowed to think about it in this way and attacking things like that, you know? So I think part of the goal of comedy is to dismantle, you know, not to be respectful. I like, I disagree with that. It's like respectful is for actual journals, <laughs> not, <laughs> not fake ones like me. <laughs> <You know? laughs> We're supposed to be disrespectful, you know? It, it feels like you. It feels like you've you've figured out a way into that over the years of I guess of having to do it. Yeah, I, it's kind of how my brain works, though. More than anything, more than figuring out. Yeah. Um, and that's why I say it's just it's kind of how I do. It. Like people say, Larry, how did you get into comedy? And I go, I'll be honest with you, I'm in showbiz, so I could get comedy out of me. You know, it's not something I got into. If I if I worked in a bank, I'd be making the same inappropriate jokes. I'd just get fired all the time. You know, <laughs> so so luckily there's this thing called showbiz that my crazy brain can can look at these things, you know, and put them in front of people in a certain way. So it's really the way that I view the world in a deconstructive way. You know, what like you if everybody's doing something, I get suspicious of it. So it's almost irrelevant what that thing is. I'm going to be suspicious as if everybody agrees on something. It's it, like, well, I don't know. This, this sounds a little suspicious to me that everybody's agreeing on this, you know? Yeah, of course. If, if everybody's sharing the exact same tweet, if everybody's doing the exact right. same thing, you're going to go, well, hold on now. You know, there's something suspicious about it. I'm not saying that they're wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm saying there's something suspicious. What do you think makes a great late night talk show? Oh, God. I mean, who knows? I mean, 
I mean, I'm on the other side of it, not the critiquing side of it. So, you know, when you have to, you have to love what you're doing and, you know, you obviously have to be good at it. You know, the classic ones are the people who just stand out as great hosts or doing something different. Like, you know, those, the early David Letterman show, there's still nothing quite like that. You know, Letterman was so different. He came on, you know, just really being himself and not trying to copy anybody else, you know. Um, Carson's kind of that standard bearer of just really letting other people be the stars and it kind of made him the star, you know. And those are things that, you know, it's kind of who those people are. But other than that, it's kind of like people's taste and what they like, I think. Do you think that the the goals of the show or what makes the show successful have changed now that people are trying to watch them more the next day on YouTube rather than staying up till 1130, 12 o'clock? Yeah, the way people consume this stuff is definitely different. You know, we're a streaming show, so we don't really air at a time. The show is just available. And that's a whole new world too, you know. Um, but yeah, people used to have an appointment with it. You know, the joke was they would go to bed with Johnny Carson. That was back in the day. But yeah, someone may watch a show on a Sunday afternoon, you know, kind of treat it like a podcast now. You know, they watch it when they want to or it follows them where they go or that type of thing. So there definitely is a different relationship that you have uh, with the new technology. Um, and it kind of affects, like for us, it's kind of affects how we actually write the show. Like our show is on once a week. We can't compete with the topical people who are on every night. So our show is what I call current. You know, we try to present something that's more current than hot topical, you know. If you're just tuning in, my guest is Larry Wilmore. We're talking about his show, Wilmore, and we're talking a little bit about his experience in, in television. And I, I would like to talk a little bit more broadly now. I mean, people know you from The Nightly Show and people know you from this new show, Wilmore. But as I mentioned in the introduction, you're quite prolific in the world of TV, whether it's writing and producing credits in shows like In Living Color and Sister Sister and The Office and The Bernie Mac Show, The Fresh Prince, The Jamie Foxx Show. I feel like every show I mentioned has incredible staying power. Like every show I just mentioned, which was a bit of a laundry list, has... And The Office. Yeah, and The Office, I mentioned in there too. What do you think... Why do you think that is? Why do you think each of those shows might have such um, staying power? I don't know. I just... I'm pretty fortunate. You know, I've worked on shows that... You know, who can guess that? I, I have no idea why that happened. You know, it's just kind of the way my career kind of tumbled and stumbled out, you know, um, cause it doesn't happen with everything. I mean, there are things that I did that aren't on that list, you know, that didn't either quite make it or, or have lasting power, you know, or kind of fell short, but those are some of the things I've been lucky to have a lot of things that did though. So very fortunate in that sense. What made you love TV in, in the first place? What made you want to work in TV in the first place? Oh, I was a TV kid growing up. I had the TV guide memorized when I was a kid. I knew every show that was on and every time and every channel. Um, just knew everything about it. I loved comedy. Always wanted to do it. Never thought that I could. And, you know, honestly, I never thought of TV as a destination. It was more comedy. You know, I wanted to make people laugh and that kind of thing. I just didn't know if it was possible to do it. And I started my career as both an actor and a stand-up comic. I was doing trying to do both of those things. And acting is tough, you know, you're you're at the behest of somebody else because you have to audition all the time and hopefully you fit in. But stand-up was fun because you just wrote an act and went up and made people laugh and you could get bookings. So I found um, a lot of uh, way to be in the business through stand-up. And many times people use their stand-up career to get a TV show and that kind of thing. So, but I really saw the act of making people laugh as the thing more than the destination of television, if that makes sense. I mean, I love television, but I never imagined that one day I'll be a television star. Like, I never saw it like that. You, were, you weren't hoping to get a job writing for the Dick Van Dyke show or something like that. You just wanted to work in Never comedy. imagined that that was even a possibility, you know. Um, I had a friend early on in school who I went to high school with, and he at a very young age, kind of broke into the business as a writer. And that opened my eyes as to that could be a possibility of doing something. It was because somebody who I knew had actually done it, you know. And uh, being lucky enough to know some people who kind of broke through. Uh, I knew Forrest Whitaker in college. Um, what was Forrest Whitaker like in college? Um, 
we didn't go to the same school, but we did this like summer thing. We traveled around doing like this weird show <laughs> and I met him in it and uh, I got to know him and he was really cool, kind of quiet, very talented though, you know, and uh, it was before he did Fast Times at Ridgemont High and, you know, became famous. But uh, when, when Forrest got his big break, I thought, oh man, you know, this can actually happen to people, you know, and that gave me like some confidence to maybe you know, actually go into it. Cause you don't know, it's easy looking back and people go, oh yeah, you did this and that. But when you're starting, you don't know what's gonna happen. You have no idea if it can even work or if you're fooling yourself, you know, if you're gonna be trying it for five and 10 years and haven't gone anywhere, then you're gonna have to have a serious wake up call about what you're doing with your life. You Is, was there a moment on, a, on any particular show where you, you sat down and you went, oh, you know what, maybe I, maybe I can do this. Maybe the imposter syndrome kind of went away, you know? Well, what I called it, it's it's a great question. Um, my daughter's kind of interested in the business and she's done things and I've had these conversations. And I said, Lauren, what, what I used for me, I called them indicators. And what indicators are is no matter what you're doing, there's something that's telling you, yeah, it looks like you're doing the right thing. you know. And they can be small, they can be big, but each time you're doing something, look for an indicator that's giving you feedback. And the indicator has to be objective too. It can't just be a friend saying or family, you know? So like the first show that I did, um, it, that was a professional thing is that the Mark Tate Perform, I got like one of the best reviews in it. And to me, that was an indicator, you know? One of my first auditions, I got a part on a TV show. So say, okay, this is, these are indicators. And I kept looking for that each time. And if I wasn't getting that, you know, if there were these walls, then I thought, all right, listen to it, like be passionate about it and be dedicated, but also be realistic. You know, if the universe is saying, sorry, this isn't happening. There's for me, I always set a period of time that I would have to listen to that, you know, but it kept saying, yeah, this seems like you're doing the right thing. So I kept going. <laughs> it's it's a it's a <laughs> profound point because it, it means to pay attention to the small things. It's easy to say, like, yeah. well, if you win an Emmy, you're going to do well in TV and you can start to ignore just a little comment, just a little note. You know what I mean? I mean, that's so down the line. <laughs> of course. Yeah. I mean, once you get to that point, you pass all the indicators, you know. But, but there are little ones that can give you confidence that don't necessarily seem big, you know, but it tells you you're doing the right thing, you know, um, that it's just paying attention and being realistic and honest with yourself is the other thing, because being honest with yourself tells you that you maybe you have to work harder at it. Like you may have the potential, but you're not working hard enough, you know, and that's paying attention to that objective reality too, you know. On the flip side of that, how do you then rationalize or deal with when you don't get the green light, you know, you get, you get the red light, you get yeah. the, the other kind of indicator that says stop, you know. And by the way, that's happened to me in different ways. And that's when I've shifted. So for me, it happened kind of from a cultural standpoint, I was doing stand-up comedy and doing pretty well, but I wasn't getting jobs. I wasn't getting acting things. There was kind of a wall there and I wasn't breaking through. And, and I, and I realized that I wasn't the type that Hollywood was really looking for. You know, they were looking for just a different type and it wasn't me, you know? And I thought if I'm going to make it, I'm going to have to take control of this. And so that was in, that was a negative indicator that said, you know, this isn't this isn't working for you from just being a performer. And that's when I decided to be a writer and producer. And I thought if I carve out my own path, I can have control over that and I can define who I am and then Hollywood will come. And that's exactly what happened. Years later, my type is more accepted. You know, I do political comedy, do absurdist stuff. But back then, if you were a black comic, if you weren't doing like deaf comedy jam type of humor, Hollywood was like, well, you're black. Why are you trying to be smart? That doesn't make sense, you know. <laughs> it's like, well, why can't I be smart and give you a thoughtful take on something? Yeah. But in the comedy clubs, they yeah. liked it. You know, when you're doing a live show, that stuff works. But Hollywood's like, mm, you got to be from the ghetto for us to put you on TV. You know, when did that change? I think that's been changing the last 10 or 15 years, it seems like, um, that casting differently on TV. But I think a lot of it is, look, I've been involved in a lot of that too, of trying to make um, the, the smart take as acceptable as the broad take, you know? One of my passions when I did the Bernie Mac show, I remember having a conversation with a friend of mine, we we're working on a show and she said, she was a black writer. She said, Larry, how come there's no black Seinfeld? Meaning 
a black show that's considered quality and funny. They were just figured funny, but they weren't like nominated for Emmys and that type of thing. Yeah. And, and, I, and I said, Janine, because you haven't written it yet. And then I was like, wait a second, I haven't written it yet either, you know? And I wanted to really make it my, really kind of my passion to have us regarded in both lights, that we could be accepted on this entertainment level, but it was respected, accepted and respected. And with winning the Emmy for the Bernie Mac pilot was huge for me, you know, it was, it was that signal that we can have it on both levels, that black people aren't just tap dancing, you know, making people happy, you know, that it's quality entertainment too. You can't just dismiss us. And, and, and it must have felt so validating given the doors you had closed and why doors were closed on you as a exactly. performer. But you're absolutely right. I used negative indicators as powerfully as I did positive ones. And there were a lot of negative ones that, you know, made me shift and and really focus me and probably were more important to my career than the positive ones, to be honest with you. You know, because it really it really gave me more of a specific purpose. Like I love being a mentor to talent because I saw how many doors were closed to us. So that made me focus on, you know, like doing Insecure with Issa Rae, you know, writing that was me saying, I want to help open the door for a talent like this and helping to do Blackish with Kenya Barris. You know, when we did that pilot, I had that same mentality. You know, it's like, you know, part of me being here is I can help this in that area because I remember that was that opportunity wasn't there for me in some ways, you know. How, how open are those doors right now? You know, I was reading an article on the way in that describes the 90s as a renaissance for black TV. And to be honest, a lot of the shows I mentioned on the way in, you look at like Sister, Sister, you, you, you look at, you know, The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. These were shows that came out in the 90s. The, the article was specifically talking about the WB in the 90s being this renaissance for black television. I, I guess, how are things now with regards to net, networks um, opening doors to well, was, greenlighting black TV? It, it was, but it goes in cycles. It went away by the end of the 90s. Um, uh, TV became a little segregated then. I've, I talked about this at the time. I talked about it contemporaneously. I was like, what is this ethnic cleansing that's going on in television, you know? Um, you just saw shows getting and, canceled. Well, yeah. I mean, when I did the Bernie Mac show, there were no black family sitcoms on television at all. None, you know? We were the only black sitcom to be on the air at the time. The only other one that came on, I think, either right before or right around the time was Damon Wayans and my wife and kids. That was it. There was no other representation, let alone people running the shows. If you talk about behind the scenes, there were no black showrunners. There was nobody doing what I was doing in comedy at that time. Ten years earlier, there were different. There were some people doing it, you know, and so it kind of there was this renaissance that did happen but then it kind of slowly faded you know um and i was very concerned about that as as well too and it took some years for that to build back up again with shonda having grays on for so long mm. and doing scandal and that type of thing shonda opened the door for a lot of people um and uh now we're in a place where it's kind of flourishing again the way it was as you pointed out in the early 90s but believe me it went through a thin period and and i was very much aware of that when you go through a thin period like that, does it make it harder to kind of relish in the moment right now? Because you know, oh, it was it once felt it once also felt good, and it's gone. It can go away. Once again, who's the one that's suspicious about things? <laughs> <laughs> Are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I take things with a grain of salt. I think it's why you have to keep working to do things. And it's for me, it's not even just a black white thing. You know, I I've always been involved in trying to just work with all kinds of voices. You know, I worked with the talented writer Jessica Gao last year in a pilot about her uh, her Chinese American family. And it was so much fun, you know, to do that. You know, I'm working with a, a native uh, writer right now uh, who's very talented, you know, doing a show. And, you know, I think people um, hearing from different voices just makes television better and it makes it harder to go back to that monolith that we had before. It's gonna be almost impossible the variety of voices that we get because the audience is going to be too discerning. They're not going to want that, you know. I appreciate your perspective on that. I, I want to talk just briefly because I don't I don't want to take up too much of your time. I want to talk briefly about the White House Correspondents' Dinner, which you you did towards the end of uh, President Barack Obama's term. What's something about that night? What's something about that gig that we wouldn't know from watching it on TV? <laughs> um, it's very surreal. Um, one of the things was I sat 
and had dinner basically right next to the first lady. And it didn't dawn on me ahead of time that that would be the case. And I just really, it was extraordinary. It was almost like an out of body experience. And we're just talking about our kids and just shooting really. And I'm like, I'm shooting the first lady. And I almost couldn't even think about the other thing, you know, for a while. And it was, it was very surreal being there, being that close to, to power like that and being in that room. The gig itself is very out of body. If you're a performer, you can relate to it where you're doing an act and there's this thing going on and you know it's not going well in the room and you just be like, whatever. And you just pile through it, you know. Yeah, I know it's that very one. Surreal. I know that one for oh, sure, but for me, it's like, you know, it's a, it's a, it's 50 drunks that don't care about me, you know, not Rush Limbaugh, no, exactly. you know? That, that's what it feels like, you know? And because as a comic, I've been in that situation thousands of times. It didn't bug me. I'm like, whatever. I'm just going to do these jokes. I don't care what you think. Cause that's the mode you go into, you know? Um, and you try to stay connected or whatever, you know? So that part to me was more common than the other part, you know? Like that didn't feel, as a comedian, we're used to, you know, bombing or whatever it is, you know, in front of an audience. But I had no idea how people were experiencing in the real world. I got so many texts for people who were watching it had a different experience than the people in the room. Because there was that, <laughs> just that weird fear of feeling in the room. But the people at home were like, oh my God, I can't believe Larry Wilbur said that stuff, you know. And it was so nice to hear from, from those people and that it got through there, you know. Can you hear... Like if you're on stage and you're telling a joke, you're so close to the president. Are you are you listening yeah. for his laugh? Yeah, and that was disconcerting because I didn't factor that in when I was thinking about doing it. And I heard him groan on the thing. I slammed him about drones or something like that. You know, and I heard him go, <laughs> I'm sorry, that's just a funny know. sentence. <laughs> I, yeah, I, exactly. I slammed him about drones or something like that. Exactly. I'm not the one that, that sent the drones. That was my philosophy, you know. <laughs> and that's what I mean about power. I don't care if everybody's kissing you. You're the president. I'm supposed to deconstruct this. You know? Yeah, yeah. And so that was my point of view on it. It's like, I love you, Obama, but I'm still going to slam you. You're the president. Yeah. You know? So uh, I heard him go, ooh. And then <laughs> suddenly I was like, oh. <laughs> the president didn't like that. And, and I immediately said, what? Am I wrong? I, what? You know, so I kind of did that comedy defensive thing. But inside, I was like, oh, shit, he didn't like that. You know, <laughs> um, as a person, I was very concerned as a comic. I was like, oh, come on. I'm just making jokes. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know if I can it. Uh, it's Canadian radio. That's OK. No, no one will hear it. Um, the uh, Are you hopeful to come back? Are you hopeful that... I mean, it's still going. I want to. I want to point out that the White House Correspondents' Dinner has been still going. I know Hasan Minhaj did it. I know they had a presidential historian whose name eludes me. But you know, the president's not there. He doesn't do stand up himself. Ever since Trump became president, are you hopeful it might come back? Um, I don't know. I I really don't have feelings towards it. I think the purpose of it was um, really a fundraiser for journalists and that kind of thing. And I thought that was always a good thing. You know. Um, they give out awards and things like that. And then the comedy part of it was just the, you know, just the entertainment thing. Um, I mean, yeah, I guess if Biden is president, I'm sure he'll probably revive it, I'm sure. But it'll it'll be interesting to see what form it takes, you know. But Trump is so humorless, you know, he's got no sense of humor. He's the thinnest skinned person to ever be president. It's amazing how how thin skinned he is. It's just shocking. I've never seen him really laugh, you know, um, so, and his, he doesn't have self-deprecating humor. He has self-adulating humor. You know, if he's making fun of himself, it's to praise himself, not to knock himself down. Why don't you think people laugh at that dinner? Like when you said like the room is weird, what does it say that the room of Washington journalists and politicos they just can't, can't take laugh, jokes they can't so. take jokes? I was I was roasting them because I thought it was a roast. That's what I thought, you know, and they just were not having it, you know. And <laughs> so it's really as simple as that. They just were not having it. Um, Don Lemon, to his credit, kind of flipped me off during it and afterwards was like hugging me. That was great. That was great. <laughs> you know that thing? And I'm like, thanks, Don. But I think Wolf Blitzer, you know, really didn't like it. I was banned from CNN for a while. Really? You know, because... I think that I'm like, whatever, CNN, get over yourself, you know. Um, I'll tell you who was real nice to me was like Fox News. Like I saw Megyn Kelly and and um, 
someone else after and they couldn't have been nicer you know uh, cause they're used to getting me fun of all the time. You know? <laughs> Wolf was going, wait, me? No, not me. I don't get made fun of. I'm Wolf yeah. Blitzer. Yes. You know, thank you for not being as harsh as most people are, Larry. You know, <laughs> that type of thing, you know. Larry, it's lovely uh, to talk to you. What, what, what are you. what are you looking at tonight? I mean, we talked a little bit about how we're not going to know anything for a little while. Tonight being quote unquote election night, even though we're taping this before, but tonight pretending right. it's election night. What are you keeping your eye on? Uh, I'm looking at Florida. If Florida goes to Biden, election's over. If it goes to Trump, it could be a long week. Well, we'll you keep... know, that's M- Margaret Atwood described it as Canadians have their nose pressed up against the glass. Yes, there you go. <laughs> I feel like it. Larry, thanks so much for your time. I, I appreciate I appreciate you guys being interested in our elections, though. It's very nice. <laughs> nice yeah. to talk to you. Thanks, Larry. Nice talking to you too. Thank you.